I want to continue with the series that we've been doing for quite some time now on preparing your kids for the real world. And I think this is part 10, if, uh, if I remember correctly. And we're still in spiritual development, and Lord willing, we will finish spiritual development today. And then we'll move on to intellectual development, and then on to social development. And spiritual development was the biggest section, so it, the rest of the study shouldn't take as long as it has up until this point. So I'm down to point 16 on page 25, if you have an outline before you. And the next thing we want to teach your kids is teach them to prefer the people of God. And that is the people in this room right here. These are the people that the Bible tells us that we ought to prefer. And the reason is because God prefers us. God prefers his people above all the rest of the people uh, in the world. If you look in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 10, the Bible here in, in at least two places calls God's people the apple of his eye. And that's one of those uh, sayings that comes from the King James Bible that we still use commonly today 400 and some years later. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 10 says, He found him, speaking of Israel, he found him in a desert land and in, a, in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. God's people are special to him. When we say that somebody is the apple of your eye, it means that this is the most important person in your life. This is your, to use an unbiblical term, pride and joy, right? Because pride's always a bad thing. But, but anyway, you get the point. This is like somebody's child, especially if you only had one, right? It's the apple of your eye, right? Well, this is what God's people are to him. You look in Zechariah 2 and verse 8, the Lord repeated this. Zechariah 2 and verse 8. You think about how you feel towards your own children, God feels that way about each one of his children. Even though sometimes we are quite unlovable, yet God looks through that and sees what Christ did for us. He sees us in Christ. He sees us perfect as we will be one day. And God loves us more than you could ever imagine loving your own children or your wife or your husband. Zechariah 2 and verse 8. It says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, after the, glory hath, uh, after the glory hath sent me unto the nations which spoiled you, for he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. So if you want to get in trouble with God, start messing with God's people. Start messing with God's church. And throughout time, enemies of God's church have been destroyed. God's church will prevail, though sometimes through bloody persecutions, but their enemies have suffered grievously. You think about the likes of a Herod who died being eaten of worms. Or you think of the likes of somebody, now this is not in the scripture, but it, it happened in the intertestamental time, a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes who went in and offered swine blood on a, an offering of swine on the altar just to desecrate it for no other reason. And that man died a horrible, horrible death, like Herod did, eaten from the inside out uh, by worms. That's what history says anyway. So when, God, when people mess with God's people, severe judgment happens to them. You want to teach your children that they should have affection for church members. Now, of course, the way that we do this, as I will get into uh, in just a little bit, is you do it by showing, right? Like I said with the last sermon and most of these sermons, saying means very little when it comes to teaching your children these kind of things. You can teach them math by saying it, right? But you can't teach them interpersonal relationships by just saying it. You've got to do it, right? You've got to show them the example. If you look in Romans chapter 12, and verse 10, this is why I picked this, one of the reasons why I picked Romans 12 for the morning scripture reading. Romans 12 and verse 10, this is instructions to a local church just like ours. This was the church in Rome. But these things apply. Paul taught the same thing in every church. These things apply to the Minneapolis church just like it did when Paul penned it 2000, almost 2,000 years ago. He said, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. There's a lot in that passage. Be kindly affectioned. So we should be affectionate and loving towards our brethren. With brotherly love one to another. It's a personal thing. In honor preferring one another. To prefer means to put in front of yourself. 
So if we prefer another person over ourselves, we put their interests and their, their best in the forefront of our interests. So we put their interest above our own interests. And this is what makes a good marriage a good marriage whenever both spouse uh, puts the interest of the other one above their own interests. And then it just becomes uh, a fight to see who can put the interest of the other one more in front of their own. And guess what? Both benefit, right? But if it's the other way around where you're fighting to put your, make, sure, make you the number one interest in your marriage, then it's, it's, it's not a, it's, it's a downward spiral instead of an upward spiral, if you know what I mean. Ephesians 4 and verse 32, likewise tells us to be kindly affectioned one toward another. Ephesians 4 and verse 32. Now this is easier said than done because most people, all of us, all people, the most important person in their life, guess who it is? Themselves, right? I mean, this is true. And if, you, if I'm, I'm sure every one of you would admit this about yourself if you really thought about it. The most important person in your life is yourself, right? You're more concerned about yourself than you are anybody else. And you have to try to, be, to put others before yourself. And that's just the human condition. Uh, Jesus Christ always put others before himself. If he was going to put himself first, he would have never come down here. And he certainly would have never died for a bunch of miserable sinners like us. So this is something that we all have to fight against in our own hearts. Ephesians 4 and verse 32. Ephesians 4, 32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So part of being kindly affection one toward another is whenever you have been wronged by somebody else that you forgive that person. You don't hold a grudge and you don't hold anger against that person. And that's what we should do for our brethren especially. You want to teach your kids to prefer their brethren in the church over themselves. Uh, Romans 12 and verse 10, which is the verse we already looked at, preferring one another. I guess I already covered that point. Um, I was looking at the kindly affection part first. But prefer one another. And then look at, look at Philippians 2 and verse 3. Philippians 2 and verse 3. This goes back to the point I was making before. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Remember what it says, how, what, how does strife come about? Strife uh, comes about by pride. Only by pride cometh contention, the Bible says. And you see here, pride and strife like it, uh, put together here again. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, which is pride, but in lowliness, which is the opposite of pride, humility, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. That's hard for us to do in our fallen nature. But I think I've told you this before, and this is one, one way that you can do that, is just think, just do a mental exercise. Think about your brethren and just go through them. Maybe you think of alphabetically, or maybe you think about where they sit in the church. It depends on how your mind works. But if, you're, if your mind works spatially, just imagine where they sit in the church and just go by one by one or alphabetically, or however you want to do it, age, or you can come up with all kinds of ideas. But go through all of your brethren and think about something that you truly admire about them where you wish that you were as good as they were at this particular thing. And it could be any number of things. Well, that's just one little way that we can esteem others better than ourselves. I don't think it would be fair to say that we ought to esteem every single member better at every single thing than we are because that's just unrealistic, right? That, that wouldn't make any sense. Um, I'm you know, certainly wouldn't, um, I wouldn't expect a person that has children to esteem a person that doesn't a better father than himself. All right, obviously, how could, right? I mean, that's clearly impossible. And there'd be any number of, of situations like that. But that's one way that you can do it. Just pick out one thing, or pick out as many things as you can think of, where you could truly esteem that other person better than yourself. Or maybe if they don't, maybe even if they don't have abilities that you have, but then imagine and look at how they deal with life given their lack of ability in a certain area or something. How do they deal with suffering or how, how do they deal with hardship? There's all kinds of things that you could look in and you could see good qualities in your brethren to prefer them above yourself. 
We want to teach your kids that they should love the brethren, which I would say goes without saying. This is what Jesus taught us in John 13. But you know, I say it goes without saying, but Jesus said it. And then John repeated it in, in 1 John. It's actually stated quite a few times, so I guess it doesn't go without saying. It'd be like saying it goes without saying that husbands should love their wives. Well, no, really it doesn't, because the Bible tells you flat out to do it. That means that we have a problem doing it, sometimes at least. Uh, John 13, 34 through 35. Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. All men will know that we are Christ's disciples if we love each other. But if somebody came to this church and they don't see a group of people that love each other, and they see a group of people that are at strife or at variance or just don't like each other, or just indifferent to each other, they're not going to walk away and say, wow, these are the disciples of Jesus Christ. They're going to say, what the heck's wrong with these people? I mean, they've got the church and they don't even like to be around each other. So this is one way that we can be sure that we can let our light shine where men will see that we love each other. When they see us doing things to help each other, that is one way that we can be guaranteed to let our light shine. Look at 1 Peter 3 and verse 8. 1 Peter 3 and verse 8. First Peter 3, 8. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. When we think of when somebody says that you're pitiful, they generally mean that you're a mess, right? But what, he's, what Peter's saying is, be, show pity toward others. Don't be a basket case that other people are going to have to show pity towards you, but show pity towards others. So when you see somebody that's going through a hard time, give them a call, send them a card, do something for them, do something nice for them if you can. Or show pity, compassion towards one another. Teach your kids that they should pray for their brethren and be concerned about them. This is one thing that every single one of us can do for every single other person, right? We may not be able to, to help out in various ways because of, of limitations, whatever they may be, but every one of us can pray for the rest of the body of the church. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 25. Let me tell you, every one of us needs this. I think sometimes we, I don't know if it's pride or what, but we don't want anybody to know things that we're going through because we just don't want them to know about it. And then when somebody finds out about it, they're like, why didn't you tell me? I could have been praying for you. Oh, well, you know, I don't need it or something. You do need it. The Apostle Paul needed it, and if he needed it, well, then we certainly need it. 1 Thessalonians 5.25, very simple instruction. Brethren, pray for us. Paul didn't have too much pride. He knew that he, knew that he needed to be prayed for. And when you read through some of the horrible descriptions of the things that the Apostle Paul went through, Obviously, he needed some prayer, didn't he? You want to teach your children that brethren should want to spend time together. But we got to, like I said, you got to, earlier, you got to do this by, by showing them, not just by telling them. Uh, Psalm 119 and verse 63. Psalm 119, verse 63. I know I've been over these verses lots of times, but they're still true. Nothing's changed as far as I know. Uh, Psalm 119 and verse 63. The psalmist said, I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. Who were this psalmist's best friends? Who were his companions? People in church, right? People that feared God and kept his precepts. And that's a pretty good description of a Christian, if you ask me. Somebody that fears God and keeps his precepts. This is the, these are the types of people that this psalmist here wanted to be hanging around. These were his buddies, right? He didn't, he, he didn't have some wall of separation between friends and church or something like that, you know, where I think sometimes uh, we, we like to section off and compartmentalize areas of our lives, and that can be okay sometimes, but I don't think it's healthy when it comes to church 
and, uh, and friends. Look at Malachi 3 and verse 16. Malachi 3.16 These believing Jews back in the Old Testament days that were winding down, getting closer to the coming of the Messiah, they spake often with, with one another. They, they spent time together. Ephes Malachi 3.16 Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. So, you see, what, 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 is the, what, what happens when you fear the Lord? Well, you want to be around other people of like mind that fear the Lord. You want to talk to them, right? Because there's not a whole lot of fellowship to be had with people in this world. There's limited amounts of fellowship, and you can enjoy people at work, or you can enjoy friends and, and people that are outside of the faith, but it's still a limited amount of fellowship. And there is nothing like having a good time, a good talk with a brother of like faith, especially a brother of like faith that happens to be a dear friend. There's just nothing like that. Nothing, at least for me, nothing, nothing but nothing compares to that in this world for me. I want to teach your children that they should desire to see, that brethren should desire to see each other. Look in 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6. Let's just, I just want you to see the Apostle Paul's mindset here. This is what this is, was his desire as a Christian, was to be among the church. 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6. It says, But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remember, remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. See, Timothy brought word back to Paul that these brethren here in Thessalonica desired greatly to see Paul. They really wanted to see him. It was going to be the highlight of their day, of their week or year, whatever it would be, whenever Paul finally showed up. They couldn't wait to see him. I love the trip that I take every summer to go back. And it, I do see family, but I always make a stop in Cincinnati. And then now I'm going to start making stops in Detroit and Grand Rapids. And I like to, I, I basically arrange my entire vacation around seeing brethren of like faith, and I get the family squeezed in there for a week in the middle. But I, I organize the whole thing around being around brethren. Look at 2 Timothy 1 and verse 4. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 4. Paul writes to this man whom he had ordained. And he says, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Paul had a desire. He wanted to see Timothy very, very badly, especially when he knew Timothy was going through a hard time. Timothy, a grown man, was full of tears. And if you don't think that can happen, then think again. And Paul desired to see Timothy. Look at Romans 1, 11 through 12. It wasn't just a fellow preacher that Paul desired to see, though. Paul desired to see these brethren here in Rome. Romans 1, verses 11 and 12. Paul says here, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. That's the great thing about whenever brethren get together. They can comfort each other with their mutual faith. Like they can build each other up. This is what Paul desired. He was going to impart to some spiritual gift to them. We don't have miraculous spiritual gifts that we can impart, but you know what? We have other spiritual gifts that we can impart. Gifts of serving each other and encouraging and admonishing one another. We have other gifts of the Spirit that we can certainly impart to each other. No man is an island, and God didn't set up Christianity to have individual Christians just out there all by themselves. 
and with just filled with the Holy Spirit or something. And God has set it up so that people, his people, congregate together. So the thing is, though, like I said, you want to teach them these things by doing them yourself. And I just have some, some practical pointers on how to do that. Uh, first of all, have church people over to your home for dinner. That's a good start. That's easy. Most people can, can do that, depending on your family situation. You know, Set and I have tried to do that since, over the, since we got married to invite uh, various people over. We've gotten, gotten the most of you anyway. Or have lunch or coffee with, uh, with the brethren after church. That's, that's one that everybody can do. You just have to, to plan on it, that's all. Make, you know, just make allotment of time for it. And that comes to the next point. Don't make plans immediately after church so that you can stick around for a while and fellowship with the brethren. Even if you can't afford to go out to eat, and that gets expensive, I know, and I can't afford to go out to eat very often either. Um, but even if it's not going out to eat, just, just hanging around. Don't plan things right after church so you have to run out. And that's something that I used to... I, that's bothered me in other churches that I've been in where people just jet out. And what really bothers me is whenever the wives make plans for the family and then are n nagging at the husband and jerking him out the door telling him that we got to go. That shouldn't be. Husbands, you ought to be telling your wives when it's time to go. They ought not to be telling you when it's time to go. You're the man. Encourage your kids to talk to other kids and adults before and after church. Get them out of their comfort zone. I would encourage you to do that. Get your kids out of their comfort zone. Teach them to, t to talk to the other kids in the church or to other adults. Don't let them just stand there in their own little area and everybody gets... That's, a lot of times that's what happens, right, in churches. People get their own little area, and it's like you don't exit that, that little circle, that physical little circle, and it happens. I mean, you're laughing because it's true, right? But teach your kids to get, to get out of that area. Go out and talk to other people, other of their brethren, especially if your kids are church members, of course. Don't let other activities take precedent over church activities. I try to never do that. I try to rearrange my schedule always to make church and church things and church people a priority in my life. I've always done that. These next few points I got from somebody else. I thought this was good. This is somebody that has kids themselves. They said, have your kids get involved in making things for a potluck or a church get-together. So that's a good way to get your kids involved when the church is having a potluck or a get-together. Instead of the mother just making everything, have the kids each help and tell them, you are helping. This is, we're going to take this to the potluck, and your brethren are going to get to enjoy this. And this is a ministry for you, if you will. This is something that you can do for your brethren to show them that, that you love them. You can have them get a church member's bed ready who's coming to stay. And that brings up the point of being hospitable. If you, we, we don't have that many non-resident members now, but when we, have, we do have a non-resident member, invite them to stay at your place, right? Don't leave it up to just one or two people. He always stays with them. It'll open up your place. Let him, you know, invite him to come over. And if you have children, then have your children get the bed ready for the brother or the sister, whoever's coming into town. And that's another way that you can teach your kids the importance of being hospitable to other people. Pray for church members at meals and talk up visits uh, from other church members. So if you've got a, a member coming into town, you've got friends coming in from another church or something like that, then talk that up with your kids. You know, get them excited about it. Let them know that this is, this is great. I mean, this is like some important person's coming to stay with us. You know, teach them to welcome. When the, when the visitor comes, have the, all the kids welcome him and, and be happy to see him. And do it yourself. Of course, you've got to show them how to do that. And help church members move or whatever. Something, whenever a church member is doing something and they need help, help them out. Make an effort to be there to help. Right? Don't just say, be ye warmed and filled. Right? You know what I'm talking about, James? So you got somebody that's destitute of daily food. Right? you got no clothing. And you say, God be with you, brother. Hope you get that jacket you're looking for. Be warmed and filled. 
Find out somebody's moving. You find out somebody needs help. Boy, boy, I hope you get the help you need. No. Volunteer. And don't just say, hey, if there's anything you, know, you need, let me know. No, just say, I'm showing up. Right? Because a lot of people, a lot of times people aren't going to say, well, you know, call you up after the fact. I need your help. Please come. No, just tell them, I'm coming. I'm going to be there. The next thing you want to teach your kids, and we're totally switching gears here, is to teach them to hate evil. And this is an important thing to teach them in this day and age, because there's a lot of evil out there. And there's a lot of propaganda that the media wants people. I mean, uh, we hear a lot about hate today, right? And, and these hate crimes and how people are filled with hate. Everybody's accusing the president of being filled with hate. I don't think the president hates anybody. I got a lot of beef with Donald Trump, but I don't think he's a hater. I don't think that at all. That's just a derogatory thing. That's, that's the catch word now that you can just throw at somebody is, you're a hater. You hate people. Well, there are certain things that need to be hated. And there's nothing wrong with hating them. And we should teach our children to hate certain things. The thing is, you have to teach your children to learn to refuse evil and choose good. When they're, especially when they're little, because they're not going to know this intuitively. They are not going to be born into this world as little angels that know the difference between good and evil. They're not. And I'll give you a verse that's just going to flat out show you that. Look at Deuteronomy 1, verses 39, or verse 39. Deuteronomy 1, 39. Deuteronomy 1, 39. It says, Moreover, your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, and your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. The land of Canaan, the promised land. Israel, their excuse was why they couldn't go and, and overcome the Canaanites in the land was because their children would end up being slaughtered. They were worried about the kids. Isn't that what every coward and what every perverse jerk always brings it down to? The children, right? It's either you're afraid because of the children or it's we have to do this wicked thing because of the children. Isn't that what they always do? Isn't, aren't the children always the excuse? But the point that I wanted there was he says, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil. The little ones, the younger children, they didn't know between good and evil. So my point is, you have to teach them the difference between good and evil, which means you have to point out, this is good, that's bad, this is evil, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Not only is there nothing wrong with it, it's absolutely necessary. Look at Isaiah 7 and verse 16. And it doesn't matter if it's a politically incorrect issue. You need to teach your children that is evil. It doesn't matter what anybody else says about it. Isaiah 7 and verse 16. Because what happens and what is happening is over the last several generations, people have been brought up and they have been taught to marginalize evil. And they have been taught to not view things that are evil as evil. And you notice things get more evil and evil and evil, and people are accepting of more and more evil. There was a time when people did not accept the evil of two people living together when they're not married. That's evil. It's called fornication. Right? There was a time when that was not accepted. Now, it, not only is it accepted, it is expected. You would be a weirdo for saying that's wrong. But you know what? You should be that weirdo that says it's wrong. Because it is. That's evil. But that's mild compared to what we have today. Then there was a time, right, not that long ago, where it was considered evil and abhorrent and deviant to be a homosexual, right? To be a sodomite. That was considered evil. It was even in the, in the psychiatrist manual of all of the, the disorders, which I think most of them are bunk anyway. But I mean, the point is, even the, world, even the people of this world recognized this is deviant behavior. Now, they took it out of there due to great pressure from the sodomite groups, right? But there was a time when pretty much most normal people knew that is wrong. Not long ago, some of you can remember those days. Jeannie, you could probably remember those days, I would think, whenever it was, it was publicly acknowledged that this is wrong and evil. And that has changed. But that, you know, I mean, that, that's pretty bad. But then there was a time, like when I was alive, 
whenever people recognized that if you went and got your sexual parts changed around and you started dressing up as somebody of the opposite sex and then started using the wrong restroom and that kind of thing, people would say you're a pervert. That is wicked. That is evil. Not anymore. Not anymore. You are intolerant if you speak against that, the transgender stuff. And what's happened is these type of things have been marginalized. In each generation it gets worse and they get more and more accepting of everything. And now the name of the game is tolerance, right? Tolerance, that is, the, that is the ultimate love out there, is to tolerate every manner of vice and wickedness. That is not love. You are not loving somebody when you tolerate that kind of wickedness in them. And now you have Christians saying something, things like, well, it doesn't affect me. Yeah, yeah I don't agree with it. Yeah, I don't agree with those guys shacking up. But I don't agree with those sodomites. I don't agree with that guy using the girls' restroom. But you know what? It doesn't affect me. Isn't that what they say? Do me a favor. Don't, I don't ever want to hear something like that out of your mouth. I will be so disgusted and disappointed if I hear you say something like that. It does affect you. You know, the sinners of Sodom and Gomorrah, they affected all of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Because the Lord rained down fire and brimstone upon all of them. Remember the wicked men in the flood, right? Can you imagine if Noah just said, well, it doesn't affect me. Yeah, he would have got drowned with the rest of them. Or I don't care what they do. They can do whatever they want. I care what they do. Now, I'm not going to go try to pass laws or something to have the government shut them down, or I'm not going to do that. But I do care what they do. You're darn right I do. As long as they don't bother me, I'm not worried about it. It bothers me. It vexes my righteous soul every day. You teach them that God hates evil. Hebrews 1 and verse 9. Hebrews 1 and verse 9. You know, I just had a thought the other day. I think the thing that makes the transgender thing specifically more abhorrent than anything else, it, with, with me anyway, is because, because I've wondered about this. So I, I, I go to a gas station down the road, and there is a man that thinks he's a woman and it's disgusting it's totally disgusting he's got man's hands there's no doubt about it he's a man right and it's just sickening to me and i won't even if i see the guy in there i'm not even going in there i hate it but then i think okay why am i so why do i have so much revulsion towards that guy why do i hate that thing so bad because i mean the girl behind the counter may be shacked up with her boyfriend right or who knows what, right? There, there's probably any number of people that I see all the time that are sinning blatantly against God. Why don't I feel the same way? You know why? I don't know it. I don't know that the girl behind the counter is shacked up with her boyfriend. How would I know that? Now, if she tells me I'm living with my boyfriend, I'm going to be just as sickened by her, as I, well, almost as sickened by her as that freak that's dressed up like a woman. Because he's just another level of sick. But still, I'm going to be just as sickened. If she's telling me that I'm having an affair, right? With, against my husband or something, I'm going to be just as sickened by her as I am by the transgender weirdo, right? That's the difference. The difference is the transgender guy doesn't have to tell you that he's a freak. His face shows you. Just to look at him, you know he is a God-hating person. He hates God's law. He hates God. I'm convinced of it. Why is he acting like that if he didn't hate God? God's the one that made him that way. Who do you think he despises? Why is he trying to change himself? He hates God. So it just dawned on me, that's why I've got such a problem with that, because it's in my face. The adulterer is not in my face, not right off the bat anyway. The fornicator is not in my face. The drunk guy that goes home every night and gets plastered, but I don't see it. All I see is a guy showing up to work a little tired or something. I don't know it. But you know what? If he showed up to work and he's just stumbling over himself, puking all over the place, I'm going to hate that guy just as much as the transgender. Right? And that kind of, that helped me understand my own feelings. Like, why am I so, why can I not stand the one guy and I don't really care so much about other situations? Because I don't know.
Hebrews 1, Hebrews 1 and verse 9. Thou hast, this is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Iniquity is another word for sin. Thou hast hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Jesus Christ was blessed and anointed because he hated sin. Hating sin is a good thing. We should hate sin. Look at Jeremiah 44, verses 3 through 4. Jeremiah 44, 3 through 4. You have these foolish Christians out there that saying that Jesus didn't hate anything or anybody. Nonsense. Jesus hated iniquity. God hates all workers of iniquity. Psalm 5, 5. Jeremiah 44, 3 through 4. Because of their wickedness, which they have committed to provoke me to anger, this is the Lord speaking, in that they went to burn incense and to serve other gods whom they knew not, neither they, ye, nor your fathers, howbeit I sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, saying, O oh, do not this abominable thing which I hate. God hates false religion. He hates it. A lot of people have the idea about God that he's just pleased as long as people are trying to worship him the way that they think is best. God hates false religion. He didn't like idolatry. He didn't like any of these false religions. He hates them all. Look at Proverbs 8 and verse 13. Proverbs 8 and verse 13. I told you that's why I wanted that door shut back there. This will be our first and last meeting here in this new place. <clears throat> Proverbs 8 and verse 13. Oh, fear of the Lord. I'm sorry. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth. Do I hate? This is wisdom speaking. Wisdom is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God. Jesus Christ hates pride, arrogancy, and the evil way. And we ought to hate evil as well in every form. You want to teach your kids that God commands them to hate evil. Look in Amos, Amos back there in the Minor Prophets, Amos 5 and verse 15. This is not an option. This is not, oh, this is just, you know, what those zealous Christians can do. No, this is what all Christians should do. Amos 5 and verse 15. Now there's a such thing as, as discretion. And you don't need to, just because you see that evil out there and you hate it, it doesn't mean that you have to stick your neck out and get it chopped off and tell everybody you meet about how, how much you hate their lifestyle. Yeah, I'm not saying you have to do that. There's a time when the righteous will keep silent in those days. It talks about that in the prophets. When things get so bad, the best thing you can do is keep your mouth shut. And that happens. I think we're there in a lot of cases. Amos 5 and verse 15. The Lord says, Hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. I think this is the prophet speaking there. Hate the evil, love the good, establish judgment. This is what it is to be a godly person. Hate evil and love good as God defines evil and good. God's ways are not our ways. Remember that. His thoughts are not our thoughts. God thinks certain things are evil that are, the world considers good. And God considers some things good that the world considers evil. You've got to remember that. You have to hate evil and love good as God sees it and defines it. Look at Romans 12 and verse 9. <clears throat> Lest you think this is just an Old Testament fire and brimstone message to the Old Testament Jews, but it's no longer true to the followers of the meek and quiet and lowly Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ. No, it's the same thing. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. Romans chapter 12 and verse 9. Romans chapter 12 and verse 9. 
Let love be without dissimulation. It means love sincerely. Don't feign love. Don't pretend like you love somebody when you don't. Abhor, that means to hate. That's a strong degree of hate. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Hate evil. Not only hate it, abhor it. Loathe it. Abominate it. You want to teach your kids that in order to fear God and to love Him, they must hate evil. You can't say, I love God, I fear God, and not hate evil. You can't look at that sodomite and, and what he's doing and say, you know what, that doesn't bother me. You can't do that and fear God. If that doesn't bother you, you don't fear God. I'm going to tell you that right now. If you've got friends that are shacking up together, and that doesn't bother you, and you don't hate that, you don't fear God. I'm going to tell you flat out. Proverbs 8 and verse 13. Let's read that one again. Proverbs 8 and verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. That's how the fear of the Lord is defined. That's one of the defining characteristics of the fear of the Lord. You hate evil. If you fear God, you hate evil. If you don't hate evil, you don't fear God, period. That's all there is to it. Psalm, um, yeah, Psalm 97, verse 10. Psalm 97, verse 10. So what does this tell me about all the people out there that are so tolerant, and they're all so lovey-dovey towards all the wicked people in this world that are destroying it? What does that tell me about them? They don't fear God, and they don't love God. All their talk of loving God, all these churches that are sodomite-friendly, they hate God. They hate God because God says that is abhorrent. And if you say that's acceptable and God says it's abhorrent, guess what? What have you done to God's judgment? You have said, you're wrong, God. What does that mean? If you tell God you are wrong, what does that mean? You hate him. You hate him. Psalm 97 and verse 10. Psalm 97 and verse 10. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. That's an imperative. If you love the Lord, you hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. <laughs> I don't think that those two things are put in that sentence there just by coincidence. God says, if you love me, hate evil. And then God says, and I'll preserve you. I'll take care of you because guess what? Men are going to hate you when you hate evil. You are going to provoke their ire. But you know what evil you ought to teach them most of all to hate? I've been talking about all this heinous, horrible stuff. You know what evil you ought to teach them to hate the most of all? Anybody tell me? What sin should they hate the most of all? Their own. Their own. Even if it's not one of the biggies. Hate your own sin. Romans 7 and verse 15. Romans 7 and verse 15. Let me tell you what. I hate the sin of sodomy and fornication and transgender stuff and all that wicked, horrible stuff out there. I hate that. But you know what? You know what I hate worse? I hate it when I get easily provoked when I shouldn't have. Well, you, I mean, you should never get easily provoked. You can be provoked. but not. I hate it when I get easily provoked. I hate it worse than that, seeing that transgender guy at the, at the gas station. I hate my own sin worse than his. Romans 7 and verse 15. And that's just one. I'm not going to name them all here for you. I don't want to make you disgusted. Romans 7 and verse 15. Paul says, and, and, and I, I, I feel okay with admitting that, you know what, I'm a vile sinner. Because Paul was a really good Christian, right? Pretty, pretty much the best of the best. And he had a lot of nasty stuff in him. Romans 7 and verse 15, Paul says, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, I do, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Paul says, what I do, I don't want to do. And I get so mad at myself when I do it. And what I don't want to do, I end up doing. Paul says, I just hate that. And when I do that which I hate, but what I hate, I do. He says, the things that I just hate, I end up doing. He hates his own sin. He hates what he's doing. I'm sure that Paul hated his own sin worse than anybody else's. And I feel the same way. 
Okay, now switching gears again. It's kind of the neat thing about this sermon is you get a whole smorgasbord of things that are not exactly related. But I was just trying to find all the, the big pertinent spiritual things to teach your kids. The next one is to be content. So we talk about loving the brethren, hating evil, and now we're talking about being content. You see, by nature, your children are not going to be content with what they have. That's just the nature of man. We're all that way, right? We're born that way. I'll give you a verse that just says it. Look in Proverbs 27, verse 20. And it's going to be probably the more affluent of a society that we live in and the more we have, the less content we're going to be. And that, that sounds weird, right? But the more you'd think the more somebody has, the more content they'd be. But you know what? If somebody has a problem with contentment, it doesn't matter how much they have. It doesn't matter. You can have, just pile more and more on. And I noticed that, that it's just, it's the nature of man. And we're really happy with our new place. And we are, and I really do like it. When I first moved in there, I was just so happy with it. Because it was just, it was way more room. I had my own office. I had our own bathroom in the bedroom. I had two sinks, just all the little things. And I was just so happy with it. Every day it was just like, you're in paradise. But you know what? That wears off. I still love it, don't get me wrong, but it's not like living in paradise anymore. It's, it's, it's good. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it. I'm content. But like as anything wears off, and I'll bet you if I were to move into Mark Zuckerberg's house or some huge mansion, I'll bet you eventually the same thing would wear off. And it'd just be like, meh, 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 it's too big, too much to clean, it's whatever. I mean, I'm sure it would wear off. That's just the nature of man. The eyes are never satisfied. Look at Proverbs 27 and verse 20. Proverbs 27 and verse 20. Hell and death are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. Just like hell's, hell's desire is never full, it always wants more men in there. So the eyes of man are never satisfied. No matter what you give us, we always want a little bit more. I mean, look at the richest people in the world. You'd think when you got multiple, multiple billions of dollars, hundreds of not hundreds of billions, um, but anyway, tens of billions of dollars. Some of these really, really rich guys, Bezos and Gates and Buffett and these guys. And you'd think when you got to that point, you couldn't possibly spend that money if, unless you're just going to buy countries or something. You couldn't ever spend that money on things that you could personally use. And you'd think it would just be enough and you'd just say, okay, I'm just going to go do something else. You know, write books the rest of my life or something. No, it's never enough. I mean, you think Bezos is going to stop at 100 billion? No way. Now, maybe it's just, you know, am I saying he's greedy, a filthy lucre? He might not be. Maybe he just loves the challenge of it, and ranking up the bank account to him doesn't really do a whole lot for them other than it's just a measure of success. I don't know. But the, the fact is, rich people never stop. At least I don't know any that do. Look at Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 8. It's the same thing. I mean, you... You, you had a job and you're making X amount and you just think, man, if I just had another 10000 I would be sitting pretty. Anybody ever been there and you get the extra 10000 and then a year later, what do you say? Oh, darn it, if I just had another $10,000, i be, because then I could pay this, this, and this. You know, It's always, it's just the standard of living, just adjusts, and then we're pretty much in the same position. So if we, were, if we were content with the less, then we'll be content with the more. But if we weren't content with the less, then we're not going to be content with the more. That's just the nature of man. Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 8. And then when you get the increase, then you wonder, how in the heck did I ever live on what I lived on before, right? How did I ever do it, right? Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 8. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the, Ill, nor, nor the ear filled with hearing. Just never satisfied. Just never, we can just, there's always something more out there to get, more out there to see. Somebody that loves seeing the world, did, did they ever see enough of it? No, right? I mean, you ever say, well, I've been to 10 countries and I've seen enough. No, I mean, if you had the means and you could do it, right, you want, I want to see more, right? That's, that's the nature of man. So you want to teach your kids to be content with what they have. This is a tough lesson. This, this takes learning. And I'll, I'll show you. i got a verse for you that, sh that shows us that this takes instruction and learning. Look in um, Hebrews, Hebrews 13 and verse 5. 
I know this is some review. I've, I've preached on this before as well. But you know what? The longer I'm your pastor, probably the more I'm probably going to touch on things that I've touched on before because you know, chances are things get reviewed once in a while. Hebrews chapter 13. But given the fact that the eyes of man are never satisfied, it probably isn't going to hurt to preach a sermon again because nobody is ever going to be fully content, including myself. Hebrews 13 and verse 5, Let your conversation, that's your manner of life, let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. You see, the opposite of being content is being covetous. Right? Being covetous is, I want more. I want what I don't have. Being content is saying, well, it'd be nice to have some more, and I could certainly see a usefulness for more, but I don't have to have more. I'm just happy where I am. I can be okay with what I have. If the Lord blesses me with more, I'll take it in, in some instances. In some instances, I might, if I'm smart, I might say no, because that would be too much stuff, and it would just, you know, it'd be, it'd be a hindrance in my life instead of a help. If I was smart, but I don't know. Most times when somebody's going to give you something, it's pretty easy to take it, right? <laughs> you want to help your kids learn contentment, and here's how you do it, by not giving them everything they want. Because if your kids grow up with the proverbial silver spoon in their mouth and everything that they want is given to them, then it's, contentment's going to be very hard because guess what? You remember what the title of this sermon is? Preparing your kids for the real world? In the real world, you don't just get everything you want. In the real world, you work for every single thing you get. And most people end up working really hard, right? Most people just don't fall into luck and, and you know, start some business where they have to do basically nothing and they just get rich. Most people just have to really work hard their whole lives. And to give your kids everything that they want is not teaching them that basic lesson of being prepared for the real world, of where I have to work, I have to save, and I have to wait to have things that I want. David was an example of a father. If you look in 1 Kings 1, 5 through 6, David was an example of a father who in, in this case, and I'm not sure, I'm not going to say categorically that he was a bad father, but he certainly had some bad qualities as a father. In one of his bad qualities was he never told his kids no. Look at 1 Kings chapter 1. 1 Kings chapter 1. David was a yes man, or a yes boy, I guess you could say. Whatever his kids want, he gave them. He never displeased them. When they wanted something, he never told them no. Maybe he just didn't want the fight. Maybe he just didn't want to see the fit being thrown or something. And whatever the boys wanted, that's what they got. Well, that came back to bite David in the butt. 1 Kings 1, 5 through 6. Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, this is David's son, one of them, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. And his father, that is David, and his father had not displeased him at any time in saying, Why hast thou done so? And he also was a very goodly man, and his mother bare him after Absalom. I don't know if it was just that particular wife or what, that David was not good with those kids because Absalom tried to take the throne from him and then Adonijah tried to take the throne from him. And this is when David was up there ready to die. See, it came back to bite him. Here he is on his deathbed, 70 years old, and now his kid's trying to take the kingdom from him. Why? Because he never displeased him. He never told Adonijah no. So it is your job, parents, to displease your children. If you are displeasing them on a regular basis, you're probably doing a good job. That doesn't mean they always have to be unhappy, but there should be times when they're unhappy because their nature is to want, 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 and if you love them, you're going to say, no, you can't have that. You want to teach them to learn to be content in the state that they're in. This is the lesson that Paul had to learn. Now, if you don't teach them, they will learn. Right, <laughs> They'll learn in the school of hard knocks. So it's probably better, and I don't think it's probably, it is better if you teach it to them now and let them learn to be content now, the younger the better, because then whenever they get into the real world someday and they realize, boy, things aren't like it, things aren't just handed to me anymore, they will have been used to things not just being handed to them, and they'll be able to accept that a lot easier. Philippians 4 in verse 11. It says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. 
I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So Paul learned and was instructed on how to be content. How? Through deprivation, right? The Lord took away from him. The Lord gave him, sometimes abounded him, sometimes he abased him. And this is how Paul learned. This is how we all have to learn. So it's good to just get your kids learning those things early while you are in a controlled environment. That's kind of the thing about parenting. Your kids are in a controlled environment. They're not left out there to the wolves. Because if you send them out there to the wolves and they've never been told no, and then all of a sudden they get in the real world, no can come in many forms, like a pink slip or a jail sentence or a whole lot of bad things. So you don't want that to happen. You want to you know, do it in a controlled environment. Teach them that they already have everything that they need to be content. Because after all, they have food and clothing. Now, I know that's not going to go over well with most kids living in America of all places. When you say, son, daughter, you already have everything you need to be content. Because you just had a meal and you have clothes right now and you're living in a house. Man, most kids aren't going to take that explanation. That's why you're going to need to tell them multiple times. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 8. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 8. And then, you know what you tell them after that? If you want it, work, save up money, and buy it. Simple. If you want it, buy it. But you're not getting the money from me. You're going to work, you're going to earn, and you're going to save, and then buy it. And that's simple. So then you're, you don't have to be Mr. Meanie all the time. There'll be certain things I wouldn't allow them to buy at certain ages. But if they want the toy and you don't want to give them the toy, just say, wait, you want the toy? Work, save, and buy it. You don't buy it on credit. You don't buy it with me loaning you money. You save and then you buy it. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 8. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. See, Paul says, as long as we got food and clothing, we should be content. And what I just said there will, will, will morph into what I'm going to talk about here in a, in a week or two. And that is teaching your kids. And we've already talked about working hard, but then we're also going to teach, talk about uh, teaching them how to go out there and make their way in the world. And that's a good way to get them thinking in that regard. Because they're going to have their natural desires. They're not going to be content. They're going to want things. And then what you do is you turn that want into work, right? If, if they want, you don't give them everything, then their, their choice is to either want or work. And depending on their temperament, some of them are going to choose to continue to want and complain, and you got to put an end to that, or they're going to choose to work, and that's good. So these things kind of will, will roll into each other as we go through this. And you can teach them that they're going to lead rich lives if they have godliness with contentment. This is one of the keys to happiness. Godliness, fearing God, keeping His commandments, being a good Christian, in other words, and being content with what you have. If you have those two things, you will be a happy person. If you don't have those two things, you're not going to be a happy person. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Nobody can bring you down if you're godly and you're content with what you have. Nobody can bring you down. I have one more point here I want to make in this, in this section on spiritual development. This is something that somebody brought to my attention after I'd already put the outline together. Um, and I thought it was worth, worthy of mentioning that you never want to use the Bible as punishment. Now, I'd never really experienced this myself. That's why I, never, I, didn't, I didn't really know anybody that did ex experience it. So I didn't even think to put it in there. But it does make sense, and I suppose that there are people that do this, and this is not a good idea. I don't mean using the Bible to whack them upside the head. I mean <laughs> making them write out verses or something like that. Like, you ever remember back in school, I don't know if they still do this or not, but if you got in trouble in school, you'd have to write out something 500 times or 100 times, like, I will not lie or I will not steal or whatever. I will not talk back. And that was punishment, right? I don't think that's the wise, I don't, I don't even think that's a good method of punishment anyway. I mean, talk about teaching a kid to despise writing. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's stupid in my opinion. But anyway, I would say it's definitely unwise to have kids write out Bible verses numerous times. Like, oh, you stole something. You're going to write, thou shalt not steal a hundred times. I don't think it's a good idea. I, I, and, and the verses that I told you, I recommended that you have your kids memorize. Um, and some of you have done that. I think it's great. 
that's a good idea. Have them memorize that and bring it to mind. But to have them write, every time that they slip up, to have them write that out a hundred times, I don't. Th I don't think that's a good idea at all. And the reason for that is that this would make the child associate the Bible with negative experiences and could cause them to resent it. Whenever their thought of the Bible is, oh yeah, that's the thing I had to write until my hand was hurting a hundred times. That's. I don't think that's a good idea. It is wise to show a child who's disobeyed you or otherwise sinned that the Bible forbids that behavior. So I'm not saying to not use the Bible to correct their behavior. That's a good idea, but the, you know, using it as punishment per se is not a good idea, I don't think. This will let them know that God condemns their bad behavior, not just you as the parent. And I, I think I talked about that a week or two ago. What is the time? Let me see. 11.15. How long have I been going here? Because... Okay, it's been an hour. I'm going to stop right there, and we will get into the intellectual development next time. So that's a good break.